Uh, Adam, I, I can't let you go. And we can't do a section really on the formidable force of Sir Alex Ferguson without talking about his feuds because there was many of them, famously with managers like Arsene Wenger and Kevin Keegan, famously with the Football Association, um, e even the media and broadcasters got it as well. Uh, where, where, where do you start with this really? Because this sort of formed such a huge part of his persona as well, didn't it? I think it was everyone. Um, everyone <laughs> and anyone at any stage yeah. could be... You know, anyone that could at any stage undermine his quest to be the most successful football team in the country would get it. Um, and I think some, you know, the story I was told about the 2002-03 season when United won the league, but they'd had to chase down Arsenal. Um, and Ferguson had nearly retired the year before, and then he changed his mind and decided to stay. And United actually started the next season quite poorly. They were behind Arsenal and they lost at Main Road against Manchester City 3-1 in the final game at Main Road. Gary Neville's mistake, Sean Gota scores. And the way it was described to me in terms of what happened over the next couple of months was basically a three-month rolling bollocking for everyone. For everyone at that football club, whether you were uh, the, the doctor, the sports science, the pro zone man, the, the media team, the website Cat on team. reception? The cast on reception. I don't think it would ever be cast on reception. To be fair. No, it shouldn't be. No. Um, um, but the players, everyone got a little bit of it. Um, and the media got it and the FA got it. Um, and basically, he'd just seen that standards had slipped a little bit. He felt standards had slipped a tiny bit and he wanted to grip the situation. And the way to grip that situation was, was by, I suppose, the temper was real. And the fury was real at what was happening, but how he used that as a tool at certain moments clearly had a massive impact. Um, and then he, you know, that was obviously the period as well where he massively revved it up with Arsene Wenger. And I think there was genuinely a period where, I think, did they hate each other? I think it's probably best to say they both hated losing. And that manifested in appearing to hate each other at times. It looked like and hate. It did, it did. Yeah. Certainly between the players, they drove the players to a stage where, you know, they absolutely hate, hated each other for a while and couldn't bear to lose. Um, they were happy to waste pizza on each other. Yeah, and it obviously all culminated in pizza landing on them. And, some, you know, some of the comments, when you read them back <laughs> now, you, you read them and you're like, wow, imagine we having a bit of that to cover in 2021. Yeah. I mean, whatever we get now is incredibly small fry compared to that but it got it got towards the end of the season um and united were going to arsenal and it had been going back and forth between wenger ferguson wenger ferguson and he's walking up to this press conference and he's talking to a few different people and everyone had expected this press conference the night before united go to highbury for this crucial ties decider to be you know a ferguson classic press conference he's going to go after wenger he's going to go big and he just said to someone as he was going into the press conference, have you ever read John McEnroe's um, book that must have been out at the time? And the person said, no. And he just said, um, McEnroe wrote that you never lose your temper in a final, despite all of McEnroe's own temper tantrums without, you know, throughout games. And Ferguson went into this press conference. He had all the newspaper number ones there waiting for this turbocharged copy. And he was just sweetness for 20 minutes, half an hour, didn't rev it up because he, as far as he was concerned, he'd driven Arsenal to the point he wanted to drive them and he was in control of the situation. The next night they draw 2-2 two -two and he goes over to the fans, gives them a fist pump and they you know, they pretty much got as close to where they needed to be in terms of getting their title back. And obviously that's one of those stories that benefits from hindsight in terms of how that season played out. But clearly there was a difference with him between how he used those feuds. It, what, he, was ne he was never really out of control with those feuds. It was always a means of maintaining control. But I'm sure Andy's got some stories of where he was just completely out of control at times and pretty terrifying to be around. And you'd probably nowadays <laughs> look at HR departments and say, this isn't really how you treat it. You know, it's not how you treat people. You can't treat people at different organisations and undermine them like this every single day. Um, but he could. He usually was right, he wasn't always right. And sometimes when he was wrong, he'd sort of admit it two months later with a, 
a cup of tea or, or a handshake. But sometimes it was just wrong. I remember when United played in Rio in January 2000 and the players went for a walk up to Christ the Redeemer statue. And as a United fan there, just minding his own business, taking pictures and Fergie got it into his head that he was a, a national journalist who was following his players around and he had a go at the fan. And the fan's a die-hard Manchester United fan who follows his team around the world. And there's no happy ending to this. There's no apology. He just had a go at him and he didn't deserve to be had a go at. That was Fergie just getting the wrong end of the stick and thinking, oh, he doesn't look like a Brazilian. He looks like my preconceived idea of what a, a newspaper journalist should look like. So I'll have a go at that person. And he didn't have a go at him. Andy, did, and a did few you like ever that, get the hairdryer? But... Yeah, yeah, had a few. And he'd want to share. I once interviewed him. Yeah, I've got no problem. Warts and all and all <laughs> that. I once uh, interviewed him and he was he was um he, he was a bit frosty with me. Right, throughout. And this was like a one hour chat at like half five in the morning, his preferred time to go to work at Carrington. And I thought, all right, it's okay. It's all right, it's going okay. And I stopped the tape at the end. And he just went ballistic at me because I'd given his autobiography a less than glowing review and he's like what do you know about books and I'm like well I've written several so I, I do know about books what do I but anyway he didn't give me a chance to even reply to that he just bang 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 like verbally bang 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 anyway son do you want a picture so I felt like he just put me on the ropes he was completely in control so that's alluding to what the, the other lads are saying and then he brought the situation back where he was again in control. Great to see you. Do you want a picture? And I sort of took a picture with the camera shaking and, and went home thinking, what have I just been hit with? And it's just his way of control. It's like he's saying, look, I'm watching everything that you're doing. I'm a, uh, I don't have to agree with everything that you're doing. And that's just, just his way of doing so. At other times, I mean, it was one of the very first interviews I did as a young journalist and I look back with massive regret because he was generous with his time and I told him I had to go because my mates were waiting for me and I looked back at the interview and it was absolutely terrible and I turned up with one of my mates because I thought that you could just turn up with one of your mates and uh, I did, I, you know, I was a kid I didn't know but at other times he'd tell me stuff off the record and I didn't really know what that meant and we'd be interviewing and he'd just say off the record we got good money for him we didn't deserve that it was no way worth that. And I thought, wow, I can't believe you're telling me this. And I, I didn't do anything with that. But maybe that was just his way of, of testing you out to, to trust you. And, of course, when you do journalism, you learn that someone says something off the record. It stays that way. And, and, and he wasn't talking about Eric Cantona, by the way. But Who was he talking about? He was always in control. I don't think it's fair to say, because <laughs> even though it was said off the record in, in September I 1996, I think it should... <laughs> I think it should probably, it should probably stay okay, off the that's record. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. All right, Andy, I think uh, I think that's a good place to leave this section. Adam, it's been brilliant to have you on Talk of the Devils and we'll get you on in the new year as well. You write a lot about Manchester United. I'm sure the fans have loved hearing from you, so thank you very much.